three, two, one. Welcome and thank you very much for joining. Today we will be discussing the German philosopher Hans Hermann Hoppe, or properly pronounced Hopp. So why should we care about Hans Hermann Hoppe? Because uh, according to many people, he's the greatest, he's considered the greatest living Austro-libertarian philosopher among Austro-libertarians. So among people around the Mises Institute or around people who are anarcho-capitalist, they consider Hans Hermann Hoppe the greatest living theorist and advocate of their ideas. So Hoppe was, is someone with whom, obviously, I disagree many things, actually most things, but what I'm going to do today is we're going to follow the same pattern we followed in other episodes and particularly solo episodes when I discuss someone I disagree, which means I'm not putting judgment aside, but this is not mostly every two minutes saying this is horrible, this is horrible, this is horrible. This is mostly presenting what are the main elements of one thought and then presenting what are the main elements of the reasons why uh, I disagree or comparing that, that person with objectivism in terms of their methods and in terms of their fundamentals. So the same thing we're going to do today with Hoppe. Feel free to ask questions, to put uh, to post the uh, super chats. Today, behind the scenes, not the Lord Emperor, but the son of uh, Caesar, Dylan, and he's going to pass the questions to me. So let's begin. And we're going to focus on three ele three elements of Hoppe's thought. So he's mostly famous for the monarchy thing and his attack on democracy. And of course, he's notorious about the physical removal idea that in a libertarian social order, communists and Democrats will have to be, quote, physically removed. We're going to get there, but we have to start from his epistemology. Because unless you understand Hoppe's epistemology and Hoppe's method, then the rest of Hoppe will not make much sense. So Hoppe is mostly, and first and foremost, his biggest contribution was his theory of, quote, argumentation ethics. So Hoppe, when he was young, he was a Marxist, and he was studying in Germany under Jürgen Habermas. Now, Habermas is like the organic intellectual of European social democracy. And very quickly, Hoppe disagreed with Habermas leftism, but he got some elements from Habermas that methodologically, we're gonna see them, uh, we're gonna see how they influence him. So at some point, Hoppe realizes that Marx is wrong, that the, the method of Marxism leads to contradictions, and he starts looking for different types of economists. He comes across Milton Friedman, but he doesn't like what he considers the positivism of Friedman. So he doesn't like this idea that in order to figure out what is good economics, we need to go out and do some research and see, for example, if we, if we impose taxes, this is what happens to the other metrics. Or if we impose tariffs, then trade goes 2% up. For Hoppe, this is not good enough. And then he comes across Ludwig von Mises. Actually, he first came across von Bavirk. So let's say the, the, the big names of the Austrian School of Economics. And he gets immediately enamored by their method. And their method is praxeology. Now, I could do a whole three-hour session about praxeology because it's something complicated, but also very central to the Austrian school. But in very simple terms, praxeology means that knowledge begins by some basic axioms. So we see, for example, the world, and we see that humans act, for example. And this is an irrefutable truth. And based on irrefutable truths, deductively, deductively, we link these irrefutable truths to other irrefutable truths. And mostly how many other Austrians call it, it's also the a priori method. So it means a priori truths, some things we take as self-evident. So for example, Hoppe says, you take as self-evident that if let's say, if this, is, if this is shorter than this, and no, let's say this is shorter than this, and this is shorter than this, then axiomatically, this is shorter than this. You don't have to go and 
test it every time that you say if A is smaller than B and B is smaller than C, then at the same time, A is smaller than C, for example. Or he says, a person cannot be at the same time in place A and place B. Hoppe says, you don't even need to test this. You know it axiomatically. So he says in the same way that we have this axiomatic knowledge about reality, there's also axiomatic uh, premises, axiomatic points of departure for economics. For example, a monopoly coercive force means in one particular area of the economy means that you're going to get uh, you're going to get an inferior product for a higher price or if all other things being equal a rise in the in a rise in the price is going to lead to a drop let's say in demand so this is how hope starts with his method his method is based again on axiomatic truths so listen what he says in the first page of his first book, a book called A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism, which is actually his only book, which is a book where it's a work which is, let's say, a coherent work in terms of not a collection of essays. The other works of Hoppe I'm going to mention are a collection of essays. So listen how Hoppe sees his work. Quote, at the end of the treatise, of the treatise it should be clear that only by means of a theory economic or moral, which is not itself derived from experience, but rather starts from a logically incontestable statement, blah, 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 and proceeds in a purely deductive way, blah, 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 to results which are themselves logically unassailable. And only this is how it's going to become possible to organize or interpret an otherwise chaotic, overly complex, array of unconnected, isolated facts. So hold this, because you're going to find this in every part of Hoppe's thought. We start from some principles that are uncontested, that are a priori true, that refuting these principles would consider, would make you commit an unforgivable contradiction. And that's how we lead to our results. Now, those of you who are more into objectivism, probably you have recognized that this is close to what Rand would consider rationalism, which is abstractions based on abstractions. And actually, this is Ayn Rand's main criticism to Ludwig von Mises, because again, Hoppe takes his methodology from Mises. So if we go to Ayn Rand's marginalia, and if you go to page 114, she says, and this is a so Mises, actually Mises says, praxeology's cognition is purely formal and general without reference to the material content and the particular features of the actual case. Again, this is close to what Hoppe says. Hoppe says, I don't need to test these things empirically to prove that they're true. And here is what is Rand's comments, what she put on the side while she was reading Human Action. This is the real motive of the whole structure. There is no a priori knowledge. There is no knowledge not derived from experience. But quote, experience does not mean what the pragmatist intended to mean. So in some ways, Rand recognizes that what Mises is trying to do, and actually what Hoppe is trying to do, is avoid empiricism. This school of thought that comes from Hume that says, well, I can never be sure. Let's say, I saw yesterday the sun came out from the east, and the day before. And also today, but I'm not sure if it's going to come uh, out of this uh, tomorrow as well. But at the same time, does not, Ayn Rand does not believe that you can have thought without reference to reality. And I try to find some criticism of objectivism, particularly to praxeology and particularly to a priori. Uh, the best thing I could find was something from Nathaniel Branden in a in the Objectivist Newsletter, Volume 2, Number 9. It's where he, where he does his criticism of Mises and of human action. Anyway, that was a long intro, but hopefully you see what is the difference between the a priorism of Hoppe with the, a priori, with, uh, with the objectivist methodology. Anyway, how is a priorism related to Hoppe's libertarianism? So Hoppe says, look, 
again, how can we make sure that libertarianism is the proper system here? And actually, he says, I'm not going to begin with values. I'm not going to begin with this idea that people, human beings, have natural, uh, natural rights. No. I will begin with a simple observation. And his observation is the following one. We live in a world of scarcity. And we live in a world where there's a constant possibility of conflict over scarce resources. So this is Hope's starting point. And actually, if you follow his lectures, quite often you might think, am I listening to the same lecture? No, in every single lecture, almost, he begins with this introduction. We live in a world of scarcity. The biggest question is how do we overcome conflicts of this scarcity? And there's one way to overcome conflicts over scarcity, and this is property rights. So for him, the main question is how can we justify property rights? And again, he says, I cannot do it on a utilitarian way because maybe I think that this is the greater good. Someone else thinks something else is the greater good. But also he says, I'm not going to do it on an ontological ground. So he says, you cannot bring, you cannot bridge a knees with a note. Therefore, we have to find something else. And there comes his argumentation ethics. So Hoppe says, look, I figured it out. Basically, the mere fact that two individuals interact with each other and argue with each other means that they agree on something fundamental. And the fundamental they agree is that they recognize each other's self-ownership. And also they recognize that this interaction has to be, for example, peaceful because they recognize that each other has a right to use his or her mind. And they recognize that even to have a discussion, you need to stand somewhere. So you need to have the idea of property. So again, with deductively, a priori, Hoppe says, look, the mere fact that someone holds a discussion with you means that whether they know it or not, they have accepted the basic premises of libertarianism, which is self-ownership and property. Of course, Hope is not stupid. He realizes that, yeah, quite often someone might put you on a torture chamber. And this means that in practice, he does not recognize your right to self-ownership. But Hope says, if that person tries to argue about the right of his position, this is self-refuting. So, for example, he says, a socialist trying to tell you that he has a right in your property means that he's self-refuted. Because his view cannot be universalizable. We see a bit of Kant here in, in Hoppe. So, for example, the rules that you propose need to be universal. For example, it doesn't make sense to say that the person who has a right in a property is the third person who goes there and works. Because what's going to happen then to the first and the second person? They're going to stay there and wait forever and starve. So this is not a universalizable rule. However, if you say that the first person who goes somewhere and homesteads that property has a right there, this is universalizable. So Hoppe says, I've solved the problem of conflict over scarcity deductively. And this is his idea of argumentation ethics. So, and because socialism cannot solve conflicts universally, because the socialists come and say, I'm going to take your house. But when you tell to the socialist, okay, and I'm going to take your house, you're going to say, no, no, you're not going to take my house. I'm going to take your house. So Hoppe says, deductively, this doesn't make sense. Therefore, socialists are refuted a priori. Now, this has been really contested even within libertarian circles. But again, I just wanted to give you a taste of Hoppe's frame of thought because we're going to find it everywhere in his thought. Thank you so much, Maria Len, for your contribution. By the way, I really appreciate it. Now, let's go to the thing that most people know Hans Hermann Hoppe about, which is his attack on democracy. So in the early 2000s, Hoppe comes up with a book which is called Democracy, the God that Failed. Okay, technically, it's a collection of essays, but it kind of makes sense as a continuum. And there he says that we have been sold a big lie. And this lie is that as history progresses, 
generally we go through more progress and a better society. And he says, look, this might make sense in terms of, yeah, we are richer, but it does not make sense in the way that we are freer. So he actually claims that there was a time where people were freer than they are today. And this was the time of the medieval ages, of the medieval times. And actually, Hoppe has been openly criticizing Steven Pinker on his The Best Angels of Our Nature thesis that there is less violence today. So Hoppe says, look, don't only look at wars and the state literally murdering you. See how the state is violating your property rights. See, for example, how today you cannot even smoke in your pub, but back in the Middle Ages, maybe you would see one state official every year. And he says, look, I, I realize that there were like horrible ways of executions back then, but he says, what makes the difference is that there was no central authority. So his criteria, his criteria here is, I want a society where the, pri- where the government is privately owned, privately owned. So he considers democracy a government where it's basically, it's owned by everyone, which means that everyone can have a take on your property. Whereas he says, at least in this type of societies, the Pope didn't have complete power because then you could move to someone else and have them as a patron. Or if that area, that feud might be bad, you would go to another feud and be under the protection of another knight or something like that. So for Hoppe, this is the idea that in a hierarchical social order, you had better chances of being closer to an idea of a private law, a law where you are accountable to another man. So for example, say, okay, I'll give you that, you give me that. But it's not the situation where it is in democracy, where it's basically everything is up for grabs. Now, of course, his theory has been criticized very fiercely. And many people are saying, look, Hoppe, if you see monarchies today and compare them with democracies, you see that democracies are doing better, even in the area of protection of rights. And Hoppe here, we come to the darkest side of Hoppe, which is Hoppe believes that actually there is no equality of, uh, let's say, skills, but not only among individuals, but among populations. So Hoppe here, we see the Hoppe, the, the collectivist. So Hoppe says, look, you cannot compare African countries with European countries. And, and we'll see Hoppe's racial thinking coming back a bit more in a while. So Hoppe says, look, you, can, you are comparing apples with oranges because I don't consider people from X continent as the same category as people from another continent. And actually he claims that, uh, he claims that today, if we had one monarch to take over the existing system, we'd be better off. And here we also see his influence on other thinkers of the reactionary right, such as, for example, Curtis Yarvin, a.k.a. Mencius Moldbach. We're going to do also an episode on Curtis Yarvin. So this is basically the idea of Hoppe. The idea of Hoppe is, look, a monarch has more of an incentive to protect you because otherwise you're going to leave. And also a monarch, in order to drag you to war, the monarch has to persuade you or the monarch has an incentive to be in good terms with you. And a monarch has an intensive not to loot the the safe of uh, of his fiefdom, because otherwise, then in five years, he's going to have nothing, as opposed to a democracy. Anyway, so this is his thesis about why monarchy is, again, by a priori uh, thinking. So he says, look, a minimal state will tend to more and more and more and more decline towards uh, socialism. Basically, therefore, the minimal state of democracy is to be dismissed. Thank you, Marilyn. So we have a question. You, Wikipedia says he's a paleo-libertarian and anarcho-capitalist. What is a paleo-libertarian? Okay, now we go to the next and the third part of uh, today's, which is uh, Hoppe's politics. So, as I said, Hoppe 
at some point realized that he's not anymore excited with Marxism. He finds the Austrian school and he gets excited and enamored with Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard is not only a famous anarcho-capitalist, but also someone who would try to find political alliances in the United States. In the 60s, he manages to find political alliance with the new left. Why? Because the number one thing for Rothbard is war and foreign policy. He wants to be to place himself against the what he calls warfare state. So then his allies are on the left. By the early 80s, sorry, by the late 80s, he sees that the new left has given up its anti-war sentiment. Who are now the anti-war people? The paleoconservatives, people who had roots in the John Beard society, people who were in the America first foreign policy. But these people were people who were socially very conservative. And these are the paleoconservatives. And if you want to find one person who concretizes paleoconservatism, Pat Buchanan, the guy who gave the very famous 92 culture wars speech. So now Rothbardians and together with them Hoppe, because by now Hoppe has moved to the States and he's studying together with uh, under Rothbard. So now the libertarians of the Rothbard kind are aligned with the paleoconservatives. And they are allied under a group that was called the John Randolph Club. And of course, if you go today and see many criticism by liberals or libertarians who are not around Mises, they will say this was a very unholy alliance because you could find very pe many people with very problematic, to use this term, views. And actually, uh, many people having racist views and things like that in paleoconservative. We're going to get back to that. So basically, at some point in the 90s, Hoppe breaks with the paleoconservatives because he's telling them, look, you guys are good when it comes to war, but you don't understand economics and you're basically socialists. So goodbye. And he's mostly, again, closer to people around the Mises Institute. But then at some point in the 2000s, Hoppe realizes that his thinking, particularly when it comes to culture, is now too toxic even for, let's say, the Mises people. So he is founding the uh, Property and Freedom Society. And there you see, there you see Hoppe and you understand his politics. So for Hoppe, what is the biggest distinction between right and left? And this is also something that has influenced Michael Malis, who uses the same test. And the test is, do you believe that all people are equal? Careful, not equal under the law, equal under in terms of uh, skills, how clever they are, how high or tall uh, sort they are, and all that stuff. And he says, if your answer is no, then you're on the right. So Hoppe begins with this. He says, look, libertarianism has to be right-wing libertarianism. But then he goes a step further. He says, look, if there are differences between people, there are also differences between different cultures. Therefore, some cultures are better for liberty. Other cultures are not so good for liberty. And here we see his, again, his uh, tribal, let's say, racial thinking. So he says, look, historically and empirically, I don't know if he has made an a priori argument of this, it's white heterosexual uh, so dominated societies that are, have been more welcome to the ideas of freedom. And this is why, this is why he wants to, he's interested in promoting also this cultural element of libertarianism. So in property and freedom society, you will find people who are quote race realist and white nationalist. So for example, and people who are paleoconservatives. So Paul Gottfried, for example, uh, Richard Spencer, before Richard Spencer became the alt-right leader. So when Richard Spencer was into white nationalism, but also he was into libertarianism. And the reason why Hoppe is doing this is because he, again, he believes that 
not all cultures are equally ready for liberty. And also because he believes that a big threat today is the left and particularly left libertarianism. So Hope has a big front open with against left libertarians. And he says the left libertarians are useful idiots for three reasons. The first is because they don't realize that these minorities that they, that they want to help are basically the Trojan horse that the state is putting forward to expand its power. The second reason is because they believe in cultural relativism and Hoppe says there is no cultural relativism. There is one culture which is good for the promotion of individual rights. And this is more or less a culture which will uh, pay respect to the biblical commands. So basically don't steal, don't want the wife of your neighbor and things like that. And the third, which is a thing that we could do a whole episode, his view on immigration. So although Hoppe is an anarchist, he believes that today the states should restrict immigration because actually when an immigrant comes in, he has a claim on a property that is not his, and he's putting an extra cost to people that have already been expropriated by paying taxes. So this is why Hoppe uh, is in favor of immigration controls. Uh, we're going to get to physical removal, which is the Hoppe meme for which he's most famous. But first, let's see a question. How are the axioms of existence exist, consciousness exist, and A is A in objectives, not a priori in the same sense as Mises uses it in, with respect to action? Okay, this is a brilliant question, which you have to ask someone who understands objectivism way better than I do. So I'm very conscious of what the limits of my understanding are, but let me try to put it in very simple terms. So the idea that existence exists, first of all, it's something which is perceptually self-evident. So I open my eyes and it's there. The same thing with the fact that I have consciousness. Again, the mere fact that I open my eyes and I see something tells me I exist and I have consciousness and something is out there. And by the way, the thing which is out there, everything is something. Now, this is not the same as a priori, because this is not ideas based on other ideas. This is the way my mind, my consciousness comes into contact with reality. But first of all, thank you so much for your super chat. But that's as far as I can go. Uh, going further into that is, uh, is not possible for me because, again, I'm not an expert in metaphysics and epistemology. What I can tell you, though, is that this is not the same with a priori. Because, again, this is something which is perceptually, like the minute I open my eyes, I see existence, I see consciousness. This is not the same with the deductive process of Hoppe. When I open my eyes and see reality, this doesn't tell me immediately that, for example, if the state has a monopoly on something, this something is, go is going to give me a higher price to a lower quality. So this would, be, this would be the difference. And I don't think it's a misunderstanding. I think a praxeologist consciously follow this abstraction based on abstraction, and they would consider it correct. And at the same time, they recognize their disagreements with Rand. Again, unfortunately, there hasn't been much criticism and much uh, an extended work on objectivism on the issue of a priori. But uh, you can check on this book, The Foundations of a Free Society. You can check some relevant uh, chapters that touch upon it. So, for example, uh, part four. And uh, there's a chapter called Economic Theory and Conceptions of Value. And again, check out Nathaniel Branden's uh, article in the Objectivist Newsletter, where he explains what's the situation with Mises' praxeology. I hope I covered it. This is as far as my limited understanding of the deep parts of metaphysics and epistemology can take me. Now, where does his very famous physical removal comes from. So let me read you the, the thing that made him notorious. So he said in one of the chapters of Democracy, the God That Failed, there can be no tolerance towards Democrats and communists in a libertarian social order. 
they will have to be physically separated and expelled from society. Likewise, in a covenant founded for the purpose of protecting family and kin, there can be no tolerance towards those habitually promoting lifestyles incompatible with this goal. They, the advocates of alternative non-family and kin-centered lifestyle, such as, for instance, individual hedonism, parasitism, nature environment worship, homosexuality or communism will have to be physically removed from society too if one is to maintain a libertarian order. End of quote. Now, this is perhaps the most controversial parts in Hoppe's thought. And at least at that point, when he wrote this, something like more than two decades ago, he made clear that I'm talking about a particular covenant. So if you have, let's say, if you buy a house in a covenant that says this, you can only buy a house here if you're not a communist, this kind of makes, we can say, okay, morally it's not okay, but you could say it makes some sense. Notice, though, that recently, and particularly with Hope flirting more and more and more and more and more with, let's say, a very particular racialist view of the right, then Hope now takes it a step further. So in one of his speeches in the Fraud, Property and Freedom Society in 2017, he says, uh, they, and again, he talks about uh, communist, uh, syndicalist, de Democrats, and all that stuff. They are posing an open threat to all private property and property owners must not only be sent, but they must, to use a by now somewhat famous Hopi and meme, be physically removed if need by violence. So basically for Hopi, you don't even have free speech in your own property if your own property is part of, let's say, a covenant, a community of people who are with ideas compatible to libertarianism. And remember, for Hoppe, these ideas are very specific, are ideas that are centered around white heterosexual Christian values. So this is basically the main issue with Hoppe. So Hoppe has this very particular view of who can be a bad neighbor. And the interesting thing is that thinking about it, that doesn't make much it, that definitely doesn't make sense a priori. So why should a priori someone, let's say, someone who is a, a gay person from uh, Peru, for example, not be as a good neighbor as uh, someone else? And in that case, Hope would say, yeah, but I'm not talking about individuals. I'm talking about uh, groups. I'm talking about groups on average. So there is definitely this tribal element in Hope. And again, you see that. Hope's view, how it's different from Rand. So Rand begins, an individual person, in order to thrive, you have to use your mind. Therefore, you have a right to free speech. Therefore, you have a right to property. And then you have to live with other people. And again, based on the independence of the mind, we reject collectivism, we reject tribalism, virtue of justice, and all that stuff. Hope doesn't be, start from there. Hope starts. There's conflict because of a scarcity of resources. By the way, the scarcity of resources thing, again, very Rand is very uncomfortable with that. With Rand, there are not resources out there that are scarce. For Ayn Rand, we create resources based on our mind. And therefore, the starting point is what are the conditions that make the individual mind flourish? Anyway, so I try to give a very, very, very short introduction to someone who is who, who has very who has written a lot who has a very complex thought uh, i disagree with him and Rand would disagree with him on so so many issues but i try to give you the very the very basics the very basics of what hope is about and i hope i did justice to that and the very basics of why from an objectivist point of view hope not only is wrong but also the way he goes completely wrong are, can be explained by the fact that he follows a method that it's easy to read to lead him to the wrong views. And yeah, I have to say also that there are people, so you can find in Property and Freedom Society lectures about uh, the Jewish lobby, uh, about uh, race relations in the US by Jared Taylor, who is again an open uh, white nationalist. And 
what would Hope say is, look, these people are in favor of a free of the right of association. So they are not racist in a way that they want to persecute. They just want to have their own covenants and then to live alone with their homogeneous community. Therefore, he would say, it's okay that I invited them. Of course, as we saw, for example, with Spencer, we saw how easy it is to go down the tribal route and forget about these, uh, these uh, principles that supposedly are related to freedom. Okay, anyway, I don't have time to get to that. For, for the final five minutes, I wanted to focus on something good in Hoppe's thought, which is his understanding of Marxism and how some of the main principles in Marxism can be correct, but for the wrong reasons. But And this is actually, I'll just say this. In one of his collection of essays, The Economics and Ethics of Private Pro Property, there's an essay called Marxist and Austrian Class Analysis, which was the one thing that completely verified that, okay, I get it, Marx is wrong. But I've already been going on for 30 minutes plus. There's no other time. Anyway, again, I tried to do justice to A, what Hoppe was, and B, what is the critique to him in a very short time. Uh, you're going to be the judge of whether this was successful. Okay, so what have we got from, where do we go from here? So tomorrow for members, we have the peak, of course. Uh, Monday, there's a daily objective with Raka and Mark, I think, on Cal Exit, the exit from California. And also, actually, no, I think that's, I think that's it. So uh, hopefully there's something for Clubhouse. So meet me there if you, have, if you want to discuss more about Hope. We left so many things aside. We left why he's popular among parts of the alt-right. Uh, we missed his influence on, uh, of, on neo-reaction. Uh, we could say more about his thought and Curtis Jarvin's thought, but we can do all that in Clubhouse if you want, or we can talk about whatever you want. Anyway, I really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.